So today we're going to talk about um, thinking about cancer, and it's just an enormous epidemic that's been happening. I know I can't see a lot of you, but maybe we can sort of just sort of raise your hand, a show of hands. How many of you um, have had friends or family members been affected by cancer? Yeah, right? there's a lot of people. I can't, I can't see you. And, and, and it's, it's not a surprise. Cancer is one of the leading causes of death. And in a room like this, actually, one in three of us will get cancer in our lifetimes. My, my, my cancer story really comes from this jolly giant in the middle. His name is Chris. He was a roommate of mine in college. Uh, he was one of those nicest guys, always there to sort of cheer you up if you had a bad day. Um, if you need any help moving or lifting heavy stuff, he was always there. We were great friends in college and stayed in touch after, after college. Um, and one day I actually got a call from Chris. Um, and instead of his normal self, there was sort of a tremble in his, in his tone. I'm like, Chris, what's wrong? It was Jimmy. I have cancer. It shook me, right? I, I was, I was in total shock. I didn't know what to say. There was this long, uncomfortable pause as I thought. The only words I could muster from my mouth was, Chris, we'll, we'll fight this together. We'll go, we'll, we'll be with you all the way. So throughout the next few years, Chris's friends, all of us gathered alongside, surrounded him with love, went to him, went along with him to the chemotherapy, to stem cell transplant, to all the different treatments and hospitals as he valiantly fought this disease. Unfortunately, four years later, he succumbed to this disease and died at a young age of 27. So like many of you in here, this, this story, unfortunately, is not unique. The World Health Organization sees cancer as one of the largest epidemics that's going to be affecting us. And like I said previously, one in three of us in this audience will be affected by, or will get cancer in our lifetime, and one in four would die from this disease. So knowing this, and this is horrible fact, I have dedicated myself to cancer research. I've been privileged to study at some of the world's leading organizations, and I went through a lot of school. I went to medical school, I did graduate school, got my MD and PhD, studied at some of these leading institutions at Johns Hopkins, Washington University St. Louis, and now I'm at the NIH at the National Cancer Institute, figuring out ways, how can we make a dent on this disease? I was part of the team that decoded the cancer exomes for breast and colorectal cancer for the first time. We worked on pancreatic cancer and medulloblastoma, brain cancers, melanoma, and it has been a real privilege and honor to be in this work. But the question still haunts me, and as I think back, is knowing what I know now, what would I tell my younger self at that time when Chris first found out? And this question is not unique. I, you know, I've sort of known as the cancer guy among my friends, and if anyone has, has cancer, they sort of come to me, and I try to figure out ways to help them and guide them, and I'm walking with many families throughout these different diagnoses. And after doing this for, for many years now, and thinking a lot about this, I've distilled some of these sort of lessons and strategies, hopefully, uh, for non-experts to be able to take advantage of what's um, the latest of technologies to be able to understand cancer. Um, in order to remember things, I created a simple mnemonic, the four Ds of defeating cancer. And hopefully, if you sort of take this home, and if help helps somebody live just a little bit longer, or even you know survive this disease, I would have done my task. The four Ds are DNA sequencing, drug trials, doctors, plural, and discoveries. The first D is DNA sequencing. Um, since the sequencing of the human genome a little bit over a decade ago, there has been an explosion in technology for us to understand our own DNA. Many of you know, DNA is the very blueprint of life. And the, the price of sequencing has dropped a million fold in the last decade, right? Something that used to cost a million dollars now only cost one dollar. And now we have a unique opportunity to profile and understand every single cancer that comes and be able to create strategies to personalize that treatment. And this is very exciting because the old methods of treating cancer are kind of barbaric. A lot of the early chemotherapies are derived from things like mustard gas and they're just poisons to poison the body, hoping to kill the cancer more, kill the cancer more than the rest of the body. So you have all these horrible side effects. 
With this new targeted therapies that are coming on board, what's exciting is that we can attack the cancer without attacking the individual. And DNA sequencing lies at the core of this. By sequencing the DNA of the tumor and compare it to the DNA of your normal cells, we can see what's different and take advantage of those differences to be able to attack the cancer and not the normal person, and for the normal person to be intact. And this is very exciting. For example, we had one patient when I was at Washington University in St. Louis. She had a really rare cancer, and she tried the early drugs, and we tried everything, and um, everything was failing. Ultimately, her DNA was sequenced of her cancer, and we were able to find that she had a gene mutation that actually was linked to a drug that's often used for pediatric leukemias. So that drug was never, you know, rarely, if ever, used for thymic tumors. It was used for her. She responded beautifully. Um, and two years later, after follow-up, she is still cancer-free. So this opens new venues and visas for us in terms of thinking about, you know, DNA sequencing for us to look at the tumor and be able to treat it specifically. And even a recent study just earlier this year looked from Memorial Stone Kettering Hospital, looking at a thousand lung tumors lung cancer patients uh, found that lung cancer patients who had sequencing done and was able to get targeted therapy based on it lived much longer um, than those who did not. But the sad thing is this technology is only still available at some of the top centers and it's still slowly disseminating. So my task here is to share the news. Right? If you or anyone have any sort of type of tumors, ask your doctor about DNA sequencing um, and think about it and look into it. The second D is drug trials. Um, and often when people hear this, they think that, oh, I don't want to be a guinea pig, right? Um, why, why should I be in a drug trial? And usually what people think is if they fail all other options, they enter into a drug trial. But actually, there are drug trials for all stages. And sometimes drug trials are available even as sort of first-line therapy in, in terms of comparing different types of first-line therapy. But the sad reality of, of cancer drugs today is 75% of cancer drugs fail as a primary drug. Right? That's three out of four. Only one in four patients are, are able to actually respond um, positively to that drug. So, so there's a big lack of, of cancer therapies to be able to help. So it's no surprise that most cancer patients fail cancer therapies very quickly and run out of options for drugs. And most of the time, you know, that's sort of the end. But if you're ever in that situation, you have a loved one in, the, in that situation, I'd say don't stop. Look into drug trials and clinical trials. Same thing um, for your loved ones, for yourself. The, the, the sad fact is only 5% actually um, of patients ever enter into drug trials. And in a recent survey when asked that, you know what, if there was a drug trial available for you, would you participate? 65% said yes. And even more, when asked about if their first line of drugs fail, would they participate in a drug, drug trial, 85% would, would consider it. But why is there only 5% then of patients being uh, as participants of drug trials? The fact is that even though there's thousands and thousands of drug trials available, it is very, very difficult for any individuals to be participate because it's sort of not anybody's job for people to be enrolled. Oncologists are so busy you know, taking care of patients in their day to day, it's hard for them to keep up with the drug trials. Family members really don't have that expertise. Right? So there's sort of a big gap in the system. Right? So if you're ever in this situation, um, I, I would highly recommend you look into drug trials. There are a lot of good websites online and advocates um, to look early um, and, and enroll. Because the people that benefit are not only the people who enroll, but all the best drugs we have today are a gift from those who participated in drug trials earlier. So by participating in a drug trial, not only may you get the most advanced drugs that's available and maybe even save your life, but you may be able to save lives of future patients with your specific cancer. I had one, I have one friend, she had a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, a, a tumor of the gut. Again, ran out of options for drugs, and she had a physician friend look into clinical trials for her. They found a drug that was in, in trials for, for the first time for this type of tumor type. She participated in it, did extraordinarily well, and 14 years later, she is still cancer-free. And now that drug is the standard of care for that type of stomach cancers, right? Um, so because of her and the contribution of patients like her, we've been able to now move that drug from investigational experimental to now standard. 
So definitely think about drug trials. The third thing to think about are doctors, plural. Just last year alone, there was 180,000 papers in one year written about in academic journals about cancer, 180,000. That's an average of about 500 papers a day, 20 in an hour, and about one single paper written in an academic journal about cancer every three minutes, 24-7. Right? That's a lot of information that's coming out, which is great news for researchers and research, but horrible news for oncologists who are struggling just to even keep up with their patient volume. So it's very, very hard for most oncologists in the community and even academic centers to keep up with all the latest literature. And even more, even the, the, the specialists and the experts become experts of, of increasingly smaller and smaller, narrow and narrow areas of, of cancer. So at the end, there is no sort of single authority on, on large cancer types, but authorities on sort of little areas of cancer. So when you go to an oncologist, right, it's very unlikely that this oncologist has all the most up-to-date information. Uh, they do amazing work, and I support, really support oncologists, but it's just unfeasible to think them, every, every oncologist to keep up with everything. So then it is sort of in the hands of patients, their family members, and to be advocates on their behalf, and to look for not one, not two, but multiple different doctors um, who may be expert in that specific cancer type, may be expert in that type of surgery, may be an expert um, in, in a specific drug treatment, um, and to, to form a team of doctors, a multidisciplinary team of doctors that come together to be able to help that patient. And that's why I emphasize doctors plural. And the, and the sad fact is the Suman G. Komen Foundation funded a study a couple of years back looking at breast cancer diagnosis and found that up to 4% of cancer diagnoses for breast cancer have, have been er erroneous, meaning they concluded that about 100,000 Americans walking in the streets of America, uh, women mostly, are, are either walking around um, with breast cancer that still remains undiagnosed or are walking around with unnecessary surgeries and treatments. So... Do yourself, do your loved ones all a favor. Look for a second opinion, a third opinion, and look for multiple doctors to be able to optimize your care. The last thing is discoveries. And at TED, we love the big ideas and new discoveries. And often that's when people ask me most about is the discoveries. The one the caveat I want to give first is you want to look at every single discovery in terms of actually, this, is, it, is it really feasible yet? I mean, is it actually true? And there's so many promises of, of cancer cures online that people find and are often not scientifically, um, and not, have not been scientifically proven and actually, you know, are, 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 are false in terms of their claims. But besides those, if you find good research, what you want to do is actually engage scientists to be able to do that. And there are, there are so much exciting research that's happening in, in cancer discovery that I'll just sort of narrow it down to three things I'll tell you about. Um, traditionally, cancer has been treated by chemicals and drugs and small molecules, but now scientists are training biological systems to be able to attack. The new drugs are not, not just sort of chemicals, but reprogrammed living organisms and species and systems that are able to attack and recognize cancer. Such systems include the immune system, such as bacteria, such as viruses. These are now tools that cancer researchers are all using um, to be able to figure out this next generation of cancer therapies. For example, the immune system, this, this area called immunotherapy, one of the largest, most exciting discoveries of last year. Methods such as what's called chimeric antigen receptors or CAR therapy, they're able to train your immune system to recognize cancers in your body. So they take out your, your, um, your, your, your cells, your immune cells, train them and put it back and it kills cancers. And it kills them so effectively that recently a study at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia for about 30 patients um, that had 30, 30 kids who had cancer that was otherwise untreatable, they found a complete response, meaning cancer gone, for 27 out of the 30 patients. But not only your own immune system, but also not new bacteria. In the lab that um, I was at, at Johns Hopkins, we were able to take a, a sporulating bacteria that only grows in oxygen-deprived environments, anaerobic bacteria, take out its toxin, 
and put drugs and help make it help it deliver hormones. So when you put it into the body, it only grows in areas where there's low oxygen. So this is actually where the tumor is, and it's able to eat away cancer. We've been doing animal trials on that, and it's not ready yet. Sort of started to do for human, but that's an area that we're really, really excited about. And lastly, viruses are even being programmed. So the herpes, herpes simplex virus, often you know people know for their cold sores, is a virus that people, uh, scientists and companies have now used to reprogram. One of the one of the cancers is melanoma, and this is actually um, in in clinical trials these days that they're able to reprogram these viruses called oncolytic viruses that's able to specifically attack and kill tumor cells. So this is a very, very exciting age of cancer therapy, if, if I would venture to say, a golden age. Um, and, and availing yourself or your, your, your friends and your loved ones of all these opportunities will give you the best survival that's possible. So again, the four Ds of defeating cancer, DNA sequencing, drug trials, doctors, plural, discoveries. Hope that this this simple mnemonic will be able to help you if in the fortunate event that you need this um, for your own use. So I come back to Chris. Um, it, is, it is fitting for me to actually be giving this talk because one of Chris's big dreams growing up in the East Coast in, in the U.S. was to be able to see the Pacific Ocean. And one of the last trips that Chris and I took um, was to come to Vancouver. Um, and we stared into a sunset very similar to this. We sat similar silence again, but this time the silence was not this awkward silence that we had at the first conversation, but it was sort of a peaceful silence, enjoying, enjoying sunset, enjoying each other's presence. As a shy Asian, at that time I wasn't able, I'm not very good at expressing my emotions, um, and I didn't say it then, and I sometimes sort of regret, but now I keep reminding myself that, that so sort of, often this message I want to give. So to Chris, to all those who, who fought and then battled against cancer, have loved ones who battled with cancer, or even if you're a cancer survivor, you are a hero. You are our inspiration. You inspire us all. Inspire us all. May we have the same bravery, the same tenacity, the same perseverance you have as we to try as we try to defeat this disease. Thank you very much.